I'm Elaine. There are some technical difficulties, so thanks for staying for that. Um, yeah, I uh, have a feedback link in the corner, and if you want to tweet at me um, or do anything, that is my tag. It's going to be in the corner of every slide. Cool. So um, this is the agenda. So we're going to I'm going to go over some context, um, mainly like about me. Um, so you. Uh, I don't know why this wasn't tagged as a beginner friendly one because this is definitely beginner friendly because I'm a beginner as you'll find out soon. Um, and then we'll talk about the problem that I um, was tasked with and then the solutions I attempted and the eventual solution that I arrived at. And then sort of the lessons learned both professionally and overall um, that came that I, uh, I guess like that I took from this problem. Great. So uh, about me. Um, so I have a non-traditional background, meaning that I studied liberal arts in undergrad. Um, thought I was going to do pre-law. <laughs> um, there is, <laughs> that's my student, and I had to make her uh, protect her identity, so I put some fake eyes on her. Um, so I studied pre-law. I joined Teach for America. I was his teacher. Um, and then I became an assistant principal or, or a founding dean at a school in Houston, Kip Legacy. and. Um, do, while I was there, I actually um, worked a lot with blended learning, which is ed tech jargon for um, sort of flipping the classroom, meaning that instead of a traditional um, teacher and an, uh, one teacher instructing a classroom of children at one level, you have devices and software um, usually delivered on things like Chromebooks and iPads um, to more personalized instruction. And it's a really lucrative business model. Um, I think there's a lot of promises that are made from EdTech. And um, my sort of frustration when I started leading the transition on our campus, at one, at, when I left, um, well, okay, my, my frustration was that there are a lot of promises and then like there were actually, but then the actual implementation of it were, um, was a little like, was a little rough. Um, for example, like when I left, we had, um, oh, this is like going to know. So when I left, we uh, had, what, four, 400 Chromebooks and, six, uh, and a fleet of 600 iPads. Um, and the students were doing all kinds of things. They were teaching themselves really quickly. And the teachers actually um, were there to be traditional teachers. And they didn't learn anything about this in university. And so they weren't really adopting, um, adopting the software. And I tried. And in order to push teachers to, to use it more, I wanted to uh, run data like an, an analysis on an administrative level. And I I would talk to these software companies. I was like, I want this data to be able to import into our grade book. And they're like, we don't do that. And I was like, all right, well, um, looking back, I was a human. I called myself a human API because I was like going to each program, exporting out a CSV, like scrubbing the data, um, putting it and then putting it into another database. And then I actually, well, into an Excel spreadsheet. And then I taught myself SQL um, because I had made my school a rudimentary database. And anyways, from there, I like I would, and then I would give the the companies that I was working with. I was like, I, I, you have these things that you could fix, and these are ways that you can improve. And they were like, oh, let me talk to my developer, and uh, well, we need to talk to our developer team. And that was like a two or three week turnaround, and it was very frustrating. And then I was like, I'm going to go to San Francisco and study software engineering. So. <laughs> This is me. So, um, so like 2016, I applied to Holberton, um, and then it was uh, 2017 was a really exciting year. Um, I met Linus Torvald. Um, <laughs> I gave him a, like, uh, well, I went to Linux, uh, the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit, um, and sort of like stalked him after the, after his keynote, and um, like gave him shirts from our school, and then asked him to take a selfie with me. Um, and then that group picture in a corner is um, after my, so my final project at Horberton, I um, dockerized a StarCraft II API. And um, Blizzard and DeepMind had worked with DeepMind to um, open up uh, StarCraft II as a learning environment for machine learning. And so I um, applied to attend a workshop that was adjacent to BlizzCon. And that, um, so, that was that. Like so, in in basically like a course of a year, because um, I was accepted on November seventh, and then um, November sixth was actually this uh, when that picture. Well, whenever the uh, whenever the workshop was. So it was really cool because within a year I was doing things. So um, 
That's, um, and then I became a software engineering um, intern at Get Century, where I started, came in expressing my deep love for bash scripts and just like bash. If you look at, actually, it's still on my Twitter profile. Um, it says there's a link to this rap that I did about bash scripts because <laughs> my school did a, um, a battle of the programming languages, and I, uh, I decided to rap about how useful bash scripts are. Um, there's a lot of curse words in that. So, um, and then on a flight, and you know, I, um, this is me talking about how I took a page of notes reading the man page for that. And then, and then this is um, my manager now at Get Century talking about, well, that's really a small text, but basically when I found out that you can do replacement with the carrot, um, and this is sort of like my team's sort of, like, what, you can do this? <laughs> uh, that was like, so uh, I still do like Bash a lot, and that's why whenever I got my first assignment, um, which was to answer this question, I uh, wanted to solve it using Bash. So the problem was, how close um, is our Google Cloud Platform resource usage to exceeding quota? So this was um, after I got my developer environment set up on February 26th, maybe like February 27th, this was the first assignment I had given to me. And so this was an example of the example usage and output that my manager, like this was like part of like the JIRA ticket or whatever. Um, so you have a script, um, you would pass arguments to it um, by giving sort of like the region. Um, I'm just... I'm not gonna go and explain Google Cloud to you guys. Um, and, and then you would have an output um, that is, uh, and like in terms of a sentence. So you would have to massage the data in a way that you would get this percentage, right? Um, the only other way that you could, that you could get this um, data at this time uh, was, again, this was February of this year, was to go to the Google Cloud console, console and sort of go like three clicks in and then you can see how close you are to exceeding quota. They have little like bar graphs there. Um, not really not really ops friendly. Um, we wanted to ultimately, well this was the first step um, of the project. The second would be to ultimately link this to a Slack notifier. Um, but uh, we were focusing on, <laughs> we were focusing on getting this to print to standard output first. Um, so I've been, this is bogus data. Um, so uh, just know that. So this is what um, there's a uh, G, G Cloud has an SDK that you can, well, a command line interface that you can um, use to grab data. And so um, you can get a JSON formatted sort of output of all of your resource usage um, and like uh, a list of all the data. And so, um, and let's zoom in. So one of the, I would be looking at the specific uh, key of for quotas, and then I would be looking at the uh, limit, metric, and usage um, fields. So uh, again, bogus data. <laughs> uh, so solutions attempted. Um, again, as you remember, I came in like loving bash scripts, uh, and of course I was like, well, this is gonna be run as a cron tab, let's do this in shell, let's do a shell script. So. I love Git because um, I was able to sort of swim through my past commits. So um, if I don't know if I said my actual start date, but it was February 26th. So I like this because you can see in the corner that February 28th, two days later after my start date, this was sort of my first commit. Um, and uh, this was just sort of me just sort of like playing around. Damn. Um, that, so, okay, so I um, this was me just trying to use something that I had saved locally as a JSON. I wasn't even going into G Cloud yet at this point, um, but I was just trying to pa um, parse a local JSON file and, um, and trying to sort of do some kind of math. Um, <laughs> God, um, I, I, oh, oh, so to extend it, uh, the regex there was because I wanted to be able to handle floats or do something with floats, um, and I was using BC, and it was just not giving me the right output. It was very frustrating. That time, um, my manager, I was telling him, I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, this is, like, I'm trying to do this in Bash. I can't handle float point arithmetic. And, and he was saying, oh, yeah, we actually have JQ on our servers. So then I was like, oh, okay. So I went and I and like brew installed JQ. Um, and then this was the second iteration using JQ, which is um, 
for you all. I guess it's a Python con convention. So um, JQ is a command line, um, uh, command line interface uh, utility that's just really great for parsing JSON. You can do really cool things, but it's, I was uh, talking to um, Josh yesterday and then um, we were talking about how like at each like version, it's, there's a lot of differences and that ended up biting me in the ass later because whenever they tried to implement this on our servers, they realized the version that I had installed locally that was able to do all this like neat filters with, um, with, with uh, percentages and, and um, doing division and all this jazz, like couldn't actually do it with the version that was installed on our servers. So at that point, it was like back to the drawing board, let's do this in Python. So, um, so uh, I've sort of like, um, I guess I can like walk us through what I did here with Python. So uh, this was my first time I actually wrote a Python script. So I actually had had a conversation with someone on my team about three days into my internship, I guess March 1st. and. Um, he was saying that, you know, like if you're doing a script, you should probably consider Python. I was like, yeah, but I don't want to because I don't know Python. <laughs> and, and then, you know, like ended up like at the end of two week, at my, the end of my second week, um, he actually sat down and sort of walked me through some of the things that we could do. Um, and it was really neat because I, um, I don't know, like, so I use argparse, uh, import JSON, um, the, uh, um, regex is so I can, um, even though we already know what all the region names are, that's just to make sure that the region name pattern matches how regions are named in G um, Google Cloud. Subprocess is of course like to call G Cloud. Um, Sysin and math, math is to, okay, uh, was so we can look at the percentages and or to round those up um, because otherwise it would just be like many decimal points and then, um, uh, the sys is to uh, look at the um, arguments. That, no, not the arguments that you pass, but so that you can. Oh, fuck, we'll find out. Okay, so <laughs> um, all right. So here we go. Uh, our part, so um, so much easier to read. So here you can see I um, I that we are uh, looking for. We're expecting these two arguments um, that are required, and so it has you have to pass region. You have to pass. Um, percentage, even that, though I wrote this six months ago, I am very like, I would be, I would have to spend some time with, the, with my uh, terminal in order to tell you what happened um, with that bash script earlier, but it's just very readable. Um, and here, um, uh, we're loading data and then we're gonna, and then we write it to, um, very, like to a list for limits, um, which I then append um, into the percentage, and then I and then I have an alert list, a separate alert list that, and that gets passed in, and that is what we later call into our um, into the Slack post. So there was a separate post of Slack script that I wrote that I'm not really talking about here, um, and that was like based on webhooks, I think. Um, yeah, super readable. All right. All right, so let's talk about the lessons that I learned from this experience. Um, it's, I, it's been really eye-opening just looking back at my experience because now I am about to reach the end of my six months at Century. And um, it, I guess it sort of worked out in a way that I was like kind of almost doing like a retrospective uh, on myself. And so for me, um, professional and personal sort of lessons. Um, I think the biggest thing that I learned and took away as an intern um, was the importance of asking questions because um, as, a, as a newcomer, like no one else knows like what I don't know. And uh, they won't know until I state that I don't know or like find a way to ask it. And it just, and it wasn't like, it wasn't as simple. It's like not just asking questions like I don't know what's happening, but it's uh, as, like being able to frame questions the right way was something that um, I've been continuing to work on. Um, and I think I used to ask a lot of like, how do I do this? And now I've shifted my mindset from how can I get something done to why does this need to be done? So to understand more like conceptually, like what is happening here? And um, so that will help me uh, arrive at a more um, like, I gotta, I have a better understanding of like what the solution is and why the solution should be such. Um, yeah, so um, the, 
One, one example of a question you might ask is, what utilities are on our servers? Um, because I, if I had asked that at the beginning, it would have saved me a lot of um, headaches trying to uh, just use pure bash to, to, to solve this problem. Um, another question are, what are the versions of the utilities on our servers? Because then I wouldn't be um, doing things with uh, JQ, uh, what was it, 1.5, um, that when uh, 1.3 is the version that's actually on our servers. Um, yeah. Uh, another question um, is, is my code readable? Um, trick question. <laughs> Because could someone that, it, that, could a newcomer come understand what's happening? Um, back when I, so when, when I was first given this assignment, it was, um, there was a, a similar script that uh, was told to be like a sort of a template or like to model it off of, and it was one that was uh, calculating, it's like taking snapshots of our, of our instances. And, I actually met with the engineer that wrote that, and, went, and it was like this like two or 300 line bash script. And as he was walking me through it, because I remember looking at it and I was like, like just like, like, I had so many questions, it wasn't documented, and I'm glad that I would talk to him about it, because as he was walking me through it, he was like saying out loud, like, whoa, like, what, this is bad, like, this is, like, what am I doing here? And, like, um, and so, like, if, like, the, oh, the, the same person that wrote it thinks it was bad, then think about just, like, someone who is new, like, could they easily understand what's happening? Um, yeah, so, uh, after that, um, I just, a big lesson that I learned and one that I continue to live through now is that Python is just simply more readable. Um, it's cleaner, you don't have, like, you don't have to use things like grep and sed in it. Um, and um, actually, I, I've told a couple people, but it's just, it's been a little harder for me to even sort of imagine where I was six months ago um, as someone that was a, as a prof, like, self-professed lover of Bash scripts, um, I still do things in like in Bash, but I probably like if it were if it was something that I was going to call over and over again as a script and that I was going to share with other people, I would do it in Python. But I mean, I do like piping things to and from, but it's like I will do like more one-off things in Bash. Um, and yeah, so uh, the second sort of like overall lesson I learned is just the power of empathy and just being empathetic. Um, because I think my team, um, because my ops, the ops team at Century is, is relatively small, well it is small, it's uh, myself as an intern and, and two other full-time engineers. Uh, no, three, because the third one's in Vienna. Um, so they often, like in our ops channel, they will often, um, state like what they don't know that like some like they'll just like think out loud like what they don't know um, and uh, own that they don't have the answers to everything that they're they have to they're that they're always learning things there's not some sort of sense that I um, am the only one that doesn't know anything there and that for me established a sense of psychological safety because I was able to then take risks and and express and then express a vulnerability where I was able to ask for help and feel like I was able yeah uh, and feel like it was a safe place for me to be like, oh, I don't actually know anything. Um, also, there were people that made time available for me in their, in their schedules to sort of walk me through like how I, so whenever I was about to write my first Python script, um, uh, my coworker Matt, he actually was like, here, let's just talk about this. And he, um, he actually like pushed me into like, he's like, let's schedule time, let's actually go into a room and like, like I'll walk you through it. And that was fantastic. And I remember like, I was like, he actually pretty much like solved it in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but I was like, all right, don't like, he, I was, and I told him specifically, like, just save this to temp, and then I want to try to do this on my own, and, um, and then I will ask you for help, like, by the end of the day. And that was great. I think another, another thing, oh yeah, is uh, just acknowledging imposter syndrome. Um, so this was me, what is this? The date on here was, uh, oh yeah, March 4th. So this was at the end of my first week, and I was just feeling, like, really down on myself because I had somehow given myself a, a deadline that my first assignment was supposed to be done by the end of the week um, without my manager actually stating that. So 
for me, the way that imposter syndrome sort of manifests itself is just this, like this asshole in the back of my mind that's just always telling me that I'm not doing the, doing enough or doing the right thing, and that somehow I am at like that I have this internship by accident. And so, what has helped me is having my like people, like my manager and my team. Um, Number one, making it safe for me to express or like ask for help, and also second, um, assuring me that I, I'm not there by accident and that I'm there, like that um, I'm on the team because when they interviewed me, that there were reasons why they chose me to join, um, and that like they just didn't let me like sl slip in. Um, yeah, and so there's no getting rid of it. This is a picture that my sister posted, and I realized that that's kind of like what imposter syndrome is. So that was my Slack avatar at work for a while. Was like, so this is me. This is like a really old picture of me holding my little sister when she was like a, a baby, um, and it's just like, like just there, like crying in the background. And I think you just sort of like live with it, and you also acknowledge that it's there, and then make moves to um, work around it. Not to work around it, but to not give it validity, I would say, yeah. Um, and I think for that, there are just different lessons that I would pass on to um, if you are a junior um, engineer like myself is first like acknowledging, um, acknowledging that uh, imposter syndrome is a thing and whether or not uh, if you don't realize that, um, don't know about it, maybe look into it, um, educate yourself about that. And then if you are a manager and or if you have mentees, making yourself available. It was really helpful when my uh, when my friend, um, well, when my coworkers uh, actually sat down, walked, when Evan walked me through his like 200 line bash script and when he was, when he openly admitted like this is shit, like um, that was just helpful for me as a newcomer thinking like, oh, well, um, they're able to acknowledge their own faults. This is like, um, and also, when people realized that it was something that I was uncomfortable with, like bash scripting and or like Python scripting, and that they actually sat, made time and uh, available. And you might have to ask your newcomers or your like uh, your new uh, members on your team more than once, because Matt actually came and talked to me two or three times about. Um, sitting down and like coding with me, and I, I think the first time I was like, no, I got this, and then second time I was like, uh, and then third time I was like, yeah, let's meet. Um, so like you might have to um, offer help more than once uh, before it finally clicks that they need it. Um, all right, I think that is the end of this. So if anyone has questions, um, I am available. Yeah, that is it. Thank you. <laughs> So we have time for a couple of questions. If Oh, and that bit.ly link in the corner is a feedback form for me. So if you have feedback for my talk, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. So my question is not really re related to Python. It's just um, you were a teacher, right? Do you yeah. like being a teacher more? Do you like being a, a software engineer more? Um, I. I definitely miss teaching, um, but the like my last years in education, I was an administrator, and I was so I was managing teachers instead of um, students. So I think um, I don't miss that as much. Uh, I think um, I don't miss managing. <laughs> I like being I like being on like on a beginner level and sort of contributing at at my space. Um, but I do miss teaching and education. Uh, I think there it's not necessarily like isolated from each other. Um, I've had opportunities to go back to my school and help out there as well, and um, and I think it's also given me a transferable skill set of being very comfortable talking in front of crowds, um, which I've been told is not normal for most developers. So uh, <laughs> I actually like this. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, like it's um, uh, so that that I guess that's an added uh, like a I guess a silver lining, or whatever. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, so with that, uh, let's give Elaine a round of applause. <laughs>